first of all, yes, uh, you already heard everything about me, so I'm going to skip over that. I, I work at Google. Uh, I also work on the open source AMP project, trying to make the web faster and more user friendly every day. Uh, but today I'm not going to talk about AMP. Well, a little bit, but we'll talk about that later. So first of all, uh, my team and I, for a very long time, many members of the developer relations team at Google have been advocating for performance um, uh, for a very long time, for the last couple of 10 years, I don't know. Um, and uh, at some point, we realized that we're preaching to the choir. We've been talking about performance constantly, and developers buy it, designers buy it, um, but um, um, it turns out that we're in a much deeper problem than we always thought. In fact, and you're, I'm going to just skip over this again because you in this room probably already know that performance is important. So yes, performance uh, directly correlates with engagement. Facebook has done some great studies on this. Most e-commerce vendors have done studies, including Amazon, Google, etc. Um, so that's not news. However, what is new, kind of newish, is uh, our generation of smartphones. And to this date, um, there's a difference in consumer expectation when it comes to smartphones. Because what the user sees, well, what we see is, OK, we're on a much smaller form factor, a worse CPU, a worse GPU. Everything is worse about this device than on our desktop computers or on our laptops. Right? As a developer, that's the kind of impression that you get. However, as a consumer, everything that's new is amazing. So the fact that you're replacing your desktop computer with your smartphone, with this new thing that you're buying, you expect it to be better and work better. Now, yes, we're in deep shit, um, because these expectations don't match up. Now, now, your first instinctive reaction would be, OK, let's squeeze out that last millisecond. Let's just try to fix everything that we have on our page going on. Sometimes you can't go further than that. Um, now, if you want to do actual performance optimizations, you can do that with tools like Lighthouse, which is what some of my team members are working on. Um, this is just a brief slide about actual performance optimization. Um, but check it out if you want to know more about how to make things actually faster. But in fact, perceived performance matters much more than actual performance. And uh, so to give you an example of what I mean by that is if you look at when the page has loaded, this actual data point, um, now, how do you measure that? Well, you could measure the time to first paint. You could measure the time to first useful paint, which is when something is actually useful. You can measure when the first viewport gets loaded. Uh, you can measure, which is what I usually measure, what is the time to interactive? When is the actual website usable? But then you could also measure the actual page load, which is almost never worth anything. So the fact that the page load doesn't correlate with how fast, how fast the page loads in a perceived way uh, should tell you more about why perceived performance matters. And I, I wrote something uh, along the lines about frame rates and the perception of motion before. So if, you, if you're curious about that, uh, check out something that I call the illusion of motion. Um, it's easy to Google, so you don't have to, to grab the link. Um, but it, it goes into the topic of how do we actually perceive motion. And then there's another good series as a starting point for what I'm talking about today, which is called Why Performance Matters uh, by Denis Mishinov. Uh, and again, easy to Google. Don't copy the link. Uh, it's on Smashing Magazine. Very recommended. But yes, we're here to talk about actual time and perceived time. And in fact, we perceive time much differently than uh, time actually runs. And the perception of performance is just as effective as actual performance in many cases, is what Apple said. And uh, Apple is really good when it comes to perceived performance. If you look at the first iterations of iOS, they were really running on underpowered devices, but looked like they performed incredibly well because they had a UI thread that animated everything, uh, any loading transition, at the time when things were loading. And so let's, let's first dive, go a little bit further back and dive into perceived reality, the past, present, and future. So let's take this postcard, OK? So you probably have heard about something, see something similar to this. Live in the moment. 
Well, there's a problem with that. It's impossible. You can't live in the moment. Because it turns out we're all living in the past. Our consciousness lags 80 milliseconds behind actual events. When you think an event occurs, it has already happened. Now, that means the postcard will not be as beautiful anymore. Um, but to actually give you uh, an example, because this kind of sounds mind-boggling, at least when I first read it. Yes, our brains have a time buffer. What this means is, for instance, in this example, um, I'm the guy in the front, and then there's another guy in the back, and I'm, I'm waving, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm calling them out. I'm saying, hello, and so the other guy listens. Now, if you are closer than 30 meters apart, then uh, uh, it, if, you, if, you can see, uh, if you can see that far, you'll see the, mouse, the, the mouth moving at the same time you hear his voice. However, if you're just one, one, uh, one meter further apart, 31 meters, the sound gets maddeningly out of sync, which is because of this 80 millisecond time buffer. The time sound travels through, uh, through the air. So really, it's not a continuous uh, uh, amount where you go you know, from 30 meters, 30, 30 meters, 40 meters, and so on. No, it's just from 30 to 31. <laughs> and that's because of this 80 milliseconds gap. And you can also see this uh, in your home studio. Same, same situation um, as, as if you have an 80 millisecond delay, and further than that, you perceive uh, as something that we call out of sync. Um, but beyond, uh, below that, you don't actually perceive it. And for an actual example, in the trading world, um, there was billions of monies uh, spent into building a, a new cable that can do uh, trading much more efficiently, algorithmic trading, um, that uh, spans the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, I think it only added a couple milliseconds, I think five or six milliseconds uh, in total to the latency from New York to London. Uh, which is enough for algorithmic traders to spend billions of dollars to actually make it happen. So the fact that that can help uh, is really interesting to me. Now, another postcard. Never let memories of the past define your view of the future. Well, that's also impossible. Why? Because there's no future without the past. Our whole concept of future is dependent upon being able to draw from memory and visualize the past. People who cannot recall long-term memories cannot envision the future. And this is really interesting to me. So uh, these tests have been done with people who only have a short-term memory and, uh, and cannot keep memory in their long-term memory, and they cannot think about the next day or the future. And then, again, how we perceive time now, these are some influences, but how we perceive time in total is, um, um, and, and how memory works is also interesting, right? Um, so you always brush up your memories, which is why this is a really interesting um, um, conversation always to be had with photographers, because um, do you want to show how it, how it actually was? Do you want to show a wedding how it actually was, or do you want to brush it up and show, show, show them how it looked like in the memories? <laughs> so. Uh, difficult decision to make. Um, but for instance, when it comes to memory, if you have an activity that has lots of moments of short activity, you remember as, as long, because if you, if you go to a Disney theme park, there's lots of stuff happening. Um, you remember all of those events as part of that your day. But if you have one long continuous activity, you're driving from LA to San Francisco, uh, you, you, your memory compresses, and you're not going to remember most of what happened in those six uh, hours. And so that, that part is compressed, and remember, the short. So yes, we suck at being a clock. That's the whole point I'm trying to make in this introduction. <laughs> um, and if you look at some of our performance guidelines in the past, we've said that the response time, so when you click a button and something should happen, should be under 100 milliseconds. And then animation should run at 60 milliseconds, 60 FPS, which is something I talked about in my blog post. And then load times should be under one second, ideally. Um, but yeah, this kind of reaction time, where does it come from, the one second number? Well, um, if, if, if you look at 
uh, lower than 200 milliseconds, something is perceived as mostly instant, which is what we've been testing and turns out to be mostly true. Under one second, which is something that Jacob Nielsen found out very early on in the 90s, um, it still feels as immediate, so you're still not losing your context. And then under five seconds, still sort of fine because it's still part of the user flow. You're still in the context. You still get the user's attention sometimes. But then under 10 seconds, that's where you completely lose the attention span. And I have some bad news because that number is now almost eight uh, seconds. And uh, I blame it on the MTD, MTV generation um, and, and Snapchat. But uh, <laughs> um, this is really interesting, right? In just a matter of about 10 years, this number shifted from 10 seconds to 8 seconds. So now you have at maximum 8 seconds to get the attention of a user. So yes, as a web performance developer, that's uh, really sad. But uh, don't worry, it gets worse. Um, <laughs> in fact, if you look at that one second load time, the context also dramatically matters. Well, what does one second load time ma mean? If you're at a train station waiting for a train, you probably are in a rush, and you want to get to something really quickly. Now, if you're running, uh, it also matters that you can uh, look at an activity really quickly. Um, and so that, that the context changes. right? Now, for instance, looking at an application means that you probably want to have zoomed in text because you're walking around. Or if you're at a coffee table, so all of these uh, a breakfast table, so all of these contexts matter when it comes to perceiving how fast something feels. Or if you're in a, in a living room. So this example, for instance, let's say you're in your, in your living room playing a game. You're booting up your console. Uh, you know you want to play an RPG for the next couple of hours. Now, this expectation, this 10-second uh, uh, drop-off, doesn't matter anymore because you're already invested into playing the game. If your console boots for one minute and then installs patches for another 10 minutes, you're still going to wait because you know you have an extended session of game time afterwards. So again, the context is really important. So train station plus 10 seconds load time, not a good idea. Home console plus one minute load time, actually fine, usually. I don't like to wait that long, but for most people, it's fine. Context matters. Another example, it takes five seconds to switch channels on my TV. That seems really slow. That seems like a shitty TV. This guy made me a burrito in five seconds. Wow, what? That's way too fast. <laughs> How did that happen? Like, that can't be a, 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 a freshly made burrito. <laughs> Wait, what? Too fast? OK, yes. Sometimes speed decreases the value of a service. Wait for it. OK. Longer wait times can build up anticipation. Uh, so that's one example of how longer wait times matter. But also, if you look at things like Coinstar, the, the coin machine that uh, counts coins that you put in, um, they've done some studies where uh, they realized that uh, the, way, the normal speed that those machines operated was actually way too quick. So uh, no one trusted them to actually count correctly. So they artificially slowed down their machines so that people trust them. The same thing happens with locksmiths. So locksmiths, which is really a tragical uh, example, um, if, if they're interns, they get a lot of tips because they dramatically fail at their job. Uh, so they, they, they pick a lock, they take hours and hours, they remove the entire lock, they put in a new lock, they destroy the door in the meantime, replace the door. Um, and because it sounds like a major effort, they get a lot of tips. If you're an actual professional, they don't tip anymore because you know, it's, a, it's a matter of a minute. So uh, really unfortunate. So if something is fast, it must be easy, right? If something is easy, it must be cheap. Uh, keep that in mind if you're building apps. Um, and and this, this sometimes matters. Now, I'm not really sure what the slide stands for, so I'm going to skip over it. Um, <laughs> OK, here we go. Uh, active versus passive waiting. Um, so this is where we come to the actual theory of perceived performance. 
And time is actually perceived much longer in the passive phase. So if you're passively waiting, you, you, uh, you heard some of it in, in Sarah's talk yesterday. And on average, people in passive wait mode overestimate their waiting time by about 36%. Um, one way to improve perception is therefore to shorten the passive phase and lengthen the active phase. The first um, of these patterns is called preemptive start. That means start work before the user realizes it. So you start working, and then only the, the other part is realized, perceived by the user. And the next method is called early completion. Show stuff before all of it is ready. But yeah, if you, if you heard this before, you know, cool story, bro. Um, I, I, I heard many of that stuff before. In fact, I think some of these you haven't heard before. And uh, there are three more patterns that I call optimistic UI, precognition, and visual illusion. Now, in that theory, let's actually get you some examples. So first, this is a very simple example, progressive images. That's an example for early completion, because we're showing you something before the image has loaded. Uh, so we're showing a completion much earlier. Or here's an example. This is why I said I'm going to talk a little bit about AMP, because we have a pretty good example here. Static layout in AMP. Uh, in AMP, and a page is completely statically layouted, and AMP always knows how big any element on the page will be before it actually loads external assets. So we can display the layout uh, before anything else has loaded, really uh, raising the perceived speed of the site. Or YouTube. If the video isn't loaded, it still starts playing back right away. It doesn't matter that the video isn't fully loaded. Uh, it starts playing right away. That's a sign for early completion. And then another one for preemptive start, multi-page forms. I don't realize, I don't really get why nobody do, no one does this, um, which makes me a lot really sad. But the fact that you have, you have the user captured on a form, right? Why don't you use that time to preload everything else? <laughs> really, no one does that. <laughs> um, but, but I think there's a point to this. Or viewport prefetching, -pre another example of, of AMP here. Um, but you could apply this to anything, really. You could build this yourself. AMP can preload the first viewport of a page uh, as opposed to the whole page. Uh, so another example of this. And if you want to do this from scratch, you can use resource sense to say prefetch or pre-render my whole website in advance before the user clicks on it. Um, so, so Google that later. Um, now another example for uh, optimistic UI is that Instagram always pretends to work, and that's because the like button always feels like it works. Uh, now, they don't actually send out the request right away after you click the like button. Um, and that's why it feels so instant. So you can do it in a tunnel. But be careful, because if you're always in a tunnel after you enter the tunnel, you know, I, maybe you want to live in the tunnel, you never want to get out again, um, then uh, the like will never go through. And therefore, Instagram lied to you in this example. Um, so, so you have to be careful about this technique. Uh, and then. Uh, an example of a precognition, which is interesting, which, which is really uh, predicting the future. Um, now, you can predict the future in some extreme examples. For instance, with sensors, with touch sensors, uh, the what we call time to glass, uh, when, uh, when you look at how fast um, a, a button, uh, sorry, a, a finger can touch down on a sensor on a touch screen. So no matter what touch events, uh, no matter what, touch events are always delayed due to hardware limitations. That means you always have a delay of around, I don't know, 30 milliseconds at least, usually around 50, 60 milliseconds. And that feels already sluggish. Uh, and so the best potential result that you have because of the display refresh rate of 60 hertz is 16 milliseconds. And we can perceive that um, um, even though we have this 80 millisecond buffer, we still perceive the delta. And if we change this to precognition, which means we are going to predict the next event before it happens, the next move, the next pixel move, before it happens, we can, uh, uh, we can simulate a 0% lag. Uh, and this is actually not theory. This has been done in iOS 9. Uh, it's been done by Windows before uh, on their Surface laptops and Surface tablets. So this is really, really cool. Uh, and, and you can test it out. You know, try scrolling something on a, on a Surface or on, on iOS, and then immediately stop uh, right after, and without you know, just panning away, but immediately stop your finger. And you see it, it's going to bounce just a tiny little bit 
because it's going to falsely predict the next move. And then, of course, you have visual illusion. Sometimes visual illusion is all it takes. In this case, easing, uh, which really matters. And I'm sure many of you have used it before. Uh, the, the, the first easing effect really uh, looks a lot slower than the ease out cubic, which is taking the same amount of time. So I'm going to skip over this because I don't have a lot of time left. But uh, browsers, there are some tricky situations where you don't really know what, what to do. Browsers only unload the current page after the new page has started rendering. Now, you could, do, uh, you could see this in two ways. A, it makes the load of the next page feel faster than it actually is. That's cool. But it also regresses responsiveness in that we don't get an immediate reaction upon that link click. So when we reverse, though, we reverse the benefits and regressions. So there's no easy way to win here. Uh, yes, sad. One way, though, one potential solution is to animate seamlessly from previous page to a new page. And that, that is something uh, that was originally proposed as navigation transitions in 2014. But sadly, in terms of web standards, no progress has been made. So if you want this, please tell uh, your favorite browser. Um, but yeah, to show you, uh, show you something in action. So this is a demo that I built uh, last week. Um, and, and it uses the Guardian as, a, as an API. Um, but as you can see, it's, a, it's an app that hopefully looks fairly snappy with some relatively seamless transitions. And, uh, and most of those clicks look instant. Uh, and, and so I just wanted to give you an example of a lot of these techniques applied in, in real life. Um, so that's, uh, that's the kind of experience that I'm always trying to aim for. Now, what's, what's going on in this app? Well, for once, you get smart skeleton UI. So if you look at, this is the, the article view. Uh, is this actually, yeah, here we go. So if you, if you look at this reloading, that's actually hard to see on, on uh, OK, this was hard to see here. But um, skeleton UIs are UIs that don't have any content in there yet. So you reload the page. And the first result you see is the filled-in UI, uh, so the, the, the formed UI, the layout itself, and then the content fills in. So this experience already dramatically adds up to the perceived performance of your page. But then I'm also re rendering all of the uh, just single viewports of the, of the pages that you click on um, uh, while they're animating. So I'm not loading the whole page until you actually uh, uh, see part of the page. And then you get some service worker caching on top that caches the first result of the page and the first three entries. Uh, and then also, of course, some seamless transitions on the way to actually um, mask the actual loading experience. Um, so all of that are concepts that we talked about applied in real life. So what I want to leave you with is really knowledge is power. Knowledge about all of this is really important. And we've been talking about this topic in particular uh, not enough. Uh, we've mostly been talking about actual performance optimization. So nobody cares about how fast your site is, just how fast it feels. Thank you. <laughs>